astrology resonates. We also observe that the moment your seniors or your professors do the homework as to what are the wires or the baskets that have to come onto your operating table, the residents somehow down the lane forget to put their mind to how to choose these guide wires and baskets. First is to know what are the guide wires and baskets available in the market and what is the R&D that goes behind it and why do they do it in the first place. And then pick and choose as to which is the guide wire or the basket that would fit the situation you are in or that would fit to a style of you know, surgery that you would perform. So over the next maybe 25 to 30 minutes, I'll try and take you through this journey of wires and baskets, uh, emphasizing on few points which we are supposed to be aware of. And then let's see how far I can get the message through. So to start with, uh, <clears throat> let me come uh, to how we define, you know, accessories as such. You know, it's always been a, a favorite slide for me to start off saying what uh, accessory is all about. It is the daily term that we use in our livelihoods about accessories. And what is accessories that we are talking about? And what does an accessory actually do? In our case, as a urologist, when we perform a surgery, these accessories should be useful to us to make the procedure even more useful, more versatile, and more attractive. So hence, an endoscope per se, so we're all obsessed with the kind of endoscopes we want to use. You know, you want to use a fiber optic scope, you want to use a digital scope, you want to use a semi-rigid scope of different make and quality. But somewhere, you know, you tend to neglect the kind of accessories that you need to make your procedure complete. So unless you have the perfect accessories aligned with the scopes that you're using, remember your endourological procedures are never complete. So for that reason, your accessories that you use become a paramount subject as far as giving a desired result is concerned. So if I have to express what is the importance of an accessories through a tiny animation or, a, or an example, imagine you have a very beautiful or a powerful handgun in your hand and you realize that the bullet doesn't go in in the way it is supposed to. I mean, you have lost the battle there. It's totally pointless. Now, if I have to draw the analogy here, if you have a wonderful iridoscope in your hand, and if it's you don't have a perfect accessory, say for example, you have a laser fiber that doesn't fit in, or a basket that doesn't go through your iridoscope, or you don't have a basket that actually does the job, then there is no fun in doing iridoscope. You can only see the stone and keep seeing it. You will not be able to do anything at all. So going forward, what is the gist of the today's talk? There are so many companies out there. There are so many brilliant manufacturers of urological accessories that manufacture a variety of guide wires, a variety of baskets, a different kind of uh, r and in place to come out with beautiful products. But how far do we actually know what is happening in the market? Very few of us, unfortunately, do follow them at a very close quarters to understand what are the new developments that are happening in the quality of guide wires, in the quality of baskets. They're actually coming out with the feedback from us, imagine. So how do these companies come out with new baskets and guide wires? They come out only after urologists give them a feedback as to what could be better and what would be a better way of using a particular accessory and how can you actually develop it? And they're doing it. Do we know that? Are we actually following it up is the biggest question that we need to answer. So the biggest challenge for us is to understand what is available in the market. And then we take it forward by choosing what suits us fine. So you should know why you should be actually knowing about these accessories. You should know where to use these accessories correctly. And you should know what it does, when to use, and in fact, whom to call or who to ask for when you need these accessories. Unless you're aware of these things, you will be totally lost. So to start with, now, how do you strategize this whole thing? First, define what you want. Now that you would know only if you have used a few accessories in your training days, different variations, different kinds, and what suits you find, then you can strategize it. Strategize it. Shortlist a few companies or a few uh, brands of accessories that you would want. Use them, do some research, see how it suits your purpose. And then you go ahead and choose the correct type of accessory you want. Coming to the topic that we are supposed to talk today, we are talking about guide wires and the baskets. Let's start with the humble guide wire, which 
is the most important product as far as endourology is concerned. What is access in endourology if only you don't have a guide wire? But if you have to look back into the history, now that's how I would always like to start off when I'm talking about the product, doesn't matter what it is, as to what are those humble beginnings of this product. Now, as far as guide wire is concerned, it was never a primary urological tool. Thanks to the cardiologists or the vascular surgeons or the people who used to conduct vascular procedures, they were the one who started using the guide wires in the first place. And then the entire story in urology began when we started using these angiographic tools for access into the urinary system as far as endourology is concerned. So if you look back at the, the publications or the first true major breakthrough as far as using guide wires in endourology is concerned, back in 1981, Fritz et al. reported in their paper in Journal of Urology about urethral obstructions and the use of guide wires. And there was no looking back after that. And there were so many advancements, so many variations, so many uh, uh, developments in guide wire till date. And the guide wire also allows a neurologist to actually experiment to attach further back then in 1980s. You know what they did? They actually attached a tiny stone basket at the tip of this guide wire. So the moment you had an access into the system, there was a novel thought that why not fix a small basket there so that we can pull the stone out. And that also gave a rise to a thought of developing a stone retrieval device in terms of stone baskets. So that's how it all began. And if you have to introduce the guide wire, I would say it is a sine qua non of endourology. What is sine qua non of endourology? It is a mandatory tool for you. There is no endourology without a guide wire. So that's how highly we place a guide wire. And it is the first means of access into a urinary tract. It could be percutaneous, it could be endourological, per ureteral, whatever it is. But you need a guide wire by and large in 99% of the times to have a safe access into the urinary system. And for that, there are two primary criteria. You want the guide wire to be soft and with a flexible tip. That's how it all began. And we will see in subsequent slides how we have improvised on these two components of soft and flexibility. Now, if you have to look at the diameters, they start from 0 0.018 to 0 0.038 inches, mind you, for the residence purpose, I keep telling this, do not get stuck with numbers by saying 1.8 and 3.8, but always be aware of the exact sizes and diameters along with its units, 0.018 to 0.038 inches. And the length varies from 145 to 250 to 260 centimeters. The length of the flex tip, this is one of the parameters we all should understand, which has, has got through a, a, a paradigm of shift as to how these uh, guide wires have been developed from a, a simple thermo guide wire to these present day hybrid guide wires. The flexible tip of every guide wire is of varied sizes. It could be as short as three centimeters to as long as 15 centimeters. So there are different guide wires with different flexible tips. So that is another parameter you should be aware of when you're picking up a guide wire as to how long is the flexible tip of a particular guide wire. And by and large, there are two layers. One is a lubricous outer flexible one and a, a, a more stable inner core. So on these parameters, let us build and go further to see more about these guide wires. On any given day, if somebody asks you, what is an ideal guide wire that you want to pick up? In any general setting of a urological procedure, it should be a combination of a flexible tip with minimal traumatic uh, feature and hydrophilicity of course, it should be uh, able to go through a neurotic tract without any friction. That is called hydrophilicity. The shaft should be stiff enough to retain the shape of the ureter so that the kings are straightened and with minimal retention friction so that the slide wire doesn't slip off. So these are the basic qualities of a guide wire. If you have to look at further as to what are those properties that you would choose before naming it as an ideal guide wire, you would categorize them into the material it is used to make, the coating over the guide wire, the tip characteristics, how thick or what is the diameter of the guide wire, how long or what is the length of the diameter uh, the guide wire, and how flexible it is, starting from the tip to the bottom. So the flexibility component also matters a lot. So now I've come out with a short acronym. Maybe by and large, you can remember in this three Cs. What are those three most important things you should understand? Know about the core of the guide wire. 
you should know about the diameter of the guideware to pick up the right cho choice and then you should know about the coating of the guideware now if you can remember these three parameters by and large by and large you will be able to pick up your perfect choice of guideware so as surgeons basically we are all trained in a way to know any uh, any any part of our journey by learning anatomy so let us do a bit of anatomy as far as guideware is concerned if you look at the components of a guideware let us divide it into a tip and the core or a shaft so what are the materials it is made of the core or it is called as a mandrel in another uh, uh, word of description it is the material that is used in the core that we need to understand the diameter of it and how it tapers as it goes towards the tip now depending on how far the core goes the flexibility of a guide wire varies so that's the secret behind saying that a flexible tip and how long the flexibility can and what are the advantages for having a longer flexible tip and why is it that only certain guide wires have a very short flexible tip the secret behind that is how far does the core extend up to the tip of the guide wire that actually means whether the flexibility of a guide wire is good or bad on the tip again of a guide wire is designed in such a way that there are coils around it so that the flexibility is intact so the tip styles are of two where the core extends up to the tip or it's in shape of a shaping ribbon so it is much more flexible than that coming to the coverings again the coverings again or if you have to look at the tip and again the shaft the shaft part of it again has a ptfe coating or a polymer made coating which is both hydrophilic or an hydrophobic depending on the kind of guide wire you would be picking and choosing and again the cover is made up of a coil like explain and of course or a polymer kind of coating the hydrophilic or hydrophobic predominant coating remains by and large the same so if you have to talk about core which becomes the true element of a guide wire it is also called as mandrel the other word for core it determines the performance characteristics of a particular guide wire the core actually tapers towards the end where the tip attaches to the core and that's that's exactly what a flexibility of a tip determines and if the core is attached closer to the tip it is much stiffer means to say even when you move it with your finger you can sense it there's a very a tiny portion of a guide wire that is actually flexible that's a very good habit to see as to how gentle the tip of a guide wire is before you actually put it through the urinary tract and if you the core attached is more proximal to the tip the tip is much more flexible so this is the the, the core aspect of how a guide wire is designed and what are the different types of cores we have like we all know a stainless steel a nitinol or a similar kind of alloys which we are seeing these days so this is where our knowledge comes in this is where it begins we all start saying that stainless steel you know guide wire nitinol guide wire or an alloy guide wire where does these uh, these topics come from yes we have to go one step before to understand what actually the core is all about so look at have a look at this picture you know it's a stainless steel core where the tip uh, the core goes all the way up to the tip hence of course a stainless steel core guide wire is much it's got a greater push ability greater support and talkability and shape hence it's got a tendency to kink but also when it kinks it retains its shape obviously that's because of the core characteristics and it it, it does cause more trauma if you tend to leave it as it is and is relatively less flexible obviously for obvious reason of the material used and also how far it goes into the tip of a guide wire when you come to the nitinol which is one of the the most commonly used or the favorite of all the urologists it is about a super elastic alloy that is designed for a kink resistance now nitinol is nothing but an alloy of nickel and titanium which has got an excellent flexibility and a steering capacity through the ureter it is much more durable as far as uh, as far as you compare it to stainless steel one and it has got a reduced prolapse character and less torqueability primarily it is much more easy for you to use an retinol guide wire which is less traumatic to the ureter it retains the shape of the ureter as far as you accessing into the pelvic system is also can you can see the difference between how a stainless steel uh, core picture in comparison with a retinol core the last uh, part of those three c's is the circumference sorry for this image but i had to use it the idea is to show you as to how a diameter core diameter varies from each a large core diameter to a smaller core diameter 
and that actually makes a lot of difference as far as flexibility is concerned the smaller the core of diameter the core and the diameter obviously the more chance that you will have a better flexibility and the larger core diameters uh, guide wires are primarily used for are a good material primarily to have a good torque that you can retain for access and for uh, instances where you have too many kinks in the ureter and we keep talking about the coatings uh, a basic sign subject of hydrophilic and hydrophobic hydrophilic uh, hydrophilicity is the primary characteristic in a guide wire which we would all love to have basically hydrophilic means it loves water it is applied over a polymer or a steel no matter what the core is it is thin non slippery when dry mind you always all the hydrophilic coatings the moment you wet the guide wire with water the lubrication comes into picture so the gel becomes more slippery when it comes to contact with water that reduces the friction hence you have always been taught during your training when you take a thermo guide wire or a hydrophilic guide wire for that matter apply some water or flush some uh, saline through the jacket of the guide wire which we use and then start using it they are so slippery at times they even slip off the surgeon's hand so be very careful when you use these guide wires and uh, develop your own trick to retain them in your hand the hydrophobic guide wires or they are more more water repellent ones silicon on uh, the surface of working area and it excludes the tip and there is no wetting required it is constantly uh, you know the surface is all uniform and it reduces the friction so that's the characteristic of a hydrophobic ones so by and large what are the types of coatings that are available it could be a ptfe coating which is the most common so these are the two most commonly used terms during your residency isn't it you ask for a hydrophilic or a thermo guide wire or a ptfe a guide wire these are the two broader classifications we always learn with so that's the most common a teflon and silicon coatings are also available which we tend not to know much about and there are other you know uh, uh, trade names for different types of coatings available in the market like pro and tel hydro track and hydro coats which are not obviously not commonly used uh, in our practice now i i've taken this uh, image just Uh, to make a point to all the residents out there just take a minute before you ask for a guide wire just take a minute to understand what this packaging actually gives to you there is this tiny square over the uh, a label of a guide wire which gives you the length of the guide wire which is around 150 cm here it gives you the diameter of a guide wire which is around 0.025 inches or 0.64 mm it gives you the flexible tip length which is around 3 cm which you can see and what kind of tip it is it is a straight tip guide wire so this label is something which you all should focus and look at it before you ask for a guide wire and learn to ask for a guide wire of precision you should ask for the type the tip the size the length the more precisely you learn to ask for guide wires in your operating room the more sure about what you are doing and what you want and that's how the atmosphere around you will build don't be very casual about your guide wires and just ask for your sister like i need a you know a thermo guide wire you don't know what size is going to come into your hand and you don't know what kind of flexible tip is going to come into your hand and there's no point screaming at people around you once you get a guide wire into your hand so make it a habit please do make it a habit and if you have to look at the various companies and the trade names that are available with fancy names i i have just made a summary and classified the guide wires into three broader aspects like a hybrid guide wire a nitinol guide wire a nitinol core ones and a kink resistant one and there are the the very fancy names which we all get to know like a sensor guide wire which is very commonly used across the world a motion guide wire which is from cook or a solo plus and all of you from different parts of the world might be using different kind of guide wires with different names but these are the names which we tend to remember rather than the proper dynamics of a guide wire we wouldn't be asking for a hydrophilic guide wire with a you know a 3 cm straight tip with uh, a 0.64 mm diameter no we don't do that we ask for say i want a sensor guide wire i want a motion guide wire so this is how we have been tuned to and this is how we are uh, you know we've been trained these days but let us understand what at least let's come back in a retrospective manner if you are if you are looking at a sensor motion or a solo plus guide or what is it it is a hybrid guide wire what is a hybrid guide wire it's got the best of the two worlds it's got flexible tip which is maybe varied from 5 to 15 uh, cm long and it's got a more flat and 
uh, a PDFE coated shaft guide wire, which is for you to retain this uh, the shape of the ureter. And the tip is to go past a ureteric obstruction of a stone or a kink or whatever it is safely into the BCS. So it's got a flexible tip which will take you through the pellicular system. And the later half of the guide wire is all PTFE coated, which is much more stiffer. And the staff reta uh, shaft retains the uh, the stiffness of the ureter. The next variety is uh, nitinol core guide wires, which are which are much much more you know softer and which are less traumatic. And these are known by its various names like zip wire, a bi wire, a high wire, and a nicor. A bi wire is something where you have the flexible tips on both the ends. And that is another uh, uh, innovation that has come up with as atraumatic as it is to the one tip of it, it is equally atraumatic on the other side when you introduce it or a backfeed the guide wire into your endoscope so that the softer tip doesn't damage your uh, optics of your endoscope. And the, the, the other uh, uh, variety of guide wires are the kink resistance, which are much more stif stiffer, which are much more robust in the way they are built like your zebra road runners or solo uh, guide wires. These are the things which you would be using with uh, obstructions that are very challenging to guide through or multiple kings where you want to retain the uh, ureteric uh, shape and gain access with your access sheath in case of RARS or in, even in case of ureteric obstructions in terms of growth where you would want to have an access into the pelvic chalicyl systems. These are much better guide wires. But mind you, guide wires can also cause trauma to the ureter they might easily find its way up through a submucosal tunnel or it could actually come out of the ureter as as comfortable as they look they can also be equally damaging so please do understand what is it that you are using and how useful they are and what are those four elements of a guide wire that you would be primarily looking at you should know about the tip bending resistance you should know about the pull force shaft bending resistance and tip puncture force. These are very you no know, terms which you would want to be using. Otherwise, these are things which we have learned back in days. Where what is the resistance that a tip needs for it to bend, and what is the force that is minimal force that is required to pull the guide wire out of the ureter much, and what is the resistance that requires to bend, and what is the tip. Uh, force that it requires to go through the pelvic elicit system or a ureter. Now, these are the elements of a guide wire which will define how safe they are. The safety of a guide wire in terms of not causing any trauma depends on these four characteristics. And there, there was a very interesting paper way back uh, by the, uh, Clement and uh, a team where they have compared quite a few uh, guide wires on various parameters or the parameters which I've just expressed and they have come out with uh, very interesting results where different kind of guide wires have different kinds of uh, characteristics. As far as the tip bending force is concerned, they have realized that these the Boston Scientific PTFE guide wire has had 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 got the you know <clears throat> most safest part of uh, minimal uh, tip bending force. That means to say, they're much more safer, isn't it? The more force you need to bend the tip, the more chances that you will perforate. As far as pull force is concerned, again it comes to this point where uh, there is an internal guide wires just slip through the guide through the ureter without causing much of trauma. In fact, I would take this opportunity to tell uh, that one of the most common causes of having traumatic ureters or a traumatic pelvic elicit system is when you actually pull the guide wire out. You tend to have a safety guide wire coiled up in the pelvic elicit system. You are busy working with your uh, working guide wire and eventually somewhere down the line, especially when you are doing your RARS. You would actually want to get the guide wire out and keep your access sheet intact. You normally casually pull it out. So that's when it actually can cause a very bad trauma, a very long vertical tears in ureter, uh, 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 maybe even a perforating kind of an injury in the pelvic elicit system. And these do cause nasty bleedings. So don't imagine that the fact that the guide wire has gone into the pelvic elicit system, it will come out very easily and without any damage. No, any guide wire that when it is coming out can cause equally bad damage as when it is going in. So for that reason, this pull force is also a very important parameter for you to understand that uh, it, it is not safe for you to just pull it out. And of course, the bending force means to say you need to really put in a lot of force for, for it to bend means to say again, you know, it is much, much safer for a guide wire which is that stiff. And last parameter being a, a tip force mean. So what I'm trying to say through this paper is when, when you're using different kinds of guide wires 
uh, across different companies, you need to know what are those parameters that you need to assess before choosing a right guide well. That is the entire idea behind this exercise. If you know that, okay, fine, I need to know about a tip bending force or a pull force, that is what you will look at when you're actually operating. Otherwise, you would be very subconsciously doing your, your, your lithotripsy, uh, lithotripsy part, you know, you're using your laser, having a ball of a time, just blasting the stone away. But somewhere down the line, you forget about these guide which you use. The more you know about this, the more chances that you will actually look deep into it. And of course, there are many papers that, that compare different kinds of guide wires and they come out with their own guidelines of which guide wire would be doing uh, better in different scenarios. I mean, let me not go into details of you know which, which company guide wires are doing best. There are very tiny differences between these uh, guide wires, but by and large, what you need to understand is what is the characteristic of a particular guide wire and how would it perform in a particular situation? If you can get a gist of this, I'm sure you will do wonderfully well in picking up the guide where you, you would actually want. To, to put it in a couple of sentences, the entire story, the idea behind uh, you know uh, having a perfect guide wire is to get an easy access, you know, get the access first with minimal trauma, ease of passing the guide wire and the tip should be flexible but with minimal friction. You, if you can find your way into the pelvic collision system, you are done per perfectly fine as far as access is concerned. As far as guide is concerned, you need a guide, uh, guide wire where the shaft is stiff enough for the catheters and stents to go seamlessly into the pelvic collision system with adequate shaft rigidity. So the two components that make all the difference as far as guide wires are concerned in endourology is access and gain and guiding the catheters and stents into the pelvic collision system. And what type of guide wire you need to choose? Yes, you need to do your homework to pick up the right one. So let's move on to the baskets now. So this is the second part of the talk called the baskets. Now the stone retrieval devices, which is broadly termed as, uh, has got a very interesting history back from the days of 1953, where the Davis stone extractor was uh, invented. And it is a five French ureteric catheter with a monofilament thread at the tip, you know, and which was used to pull a dislutric stone. That's, that's how simple the design was. And that's how innovative it started off. And then came the Domia, the helical basket, which was a revolutionary design back in the 80s, where they reported over 90% of the stones, even in the proximal ureter, can be safely treated. And that, that actually opened up, opened up a, a sea of opportunities for developing newer kinds of baskets, like your Segura basket, which is a flat and a non-helical device, primarily used to snare the tumors, you know, papillary tumors and to pick up a biopsy. And this was a most famously used basket then. And of course, the retinol basket with which actually revolutionized uh, the kind of baskets that came out, the material of nitinol, minimal restriction of endoscopic deflection, the, especially when flexible ureteroscopy came into picture and nitinol baskets became the most sought after baskets because they didn't hamper much with the flexibility. Like we saw the properties of a guide wire, what are the properties of a basket that makes the difference? It's about the configuration of the basket. What are the linear opening dynamics of a basket that makes it very important for you to understand which is the right basket for you. What do you mean by linear opening dynamics is to how exactly the basket opens, you know, what is the strength that is required for the basket to open up safely without damaging the ureter, yet capturing the stones and being stable within the ureter. Basket visibility during stone manipulation is very important. It is one of the most common scenarios for residents when they're actually starting off is to lose a track of where the basket is. Suddenly they feel a void and they feel there are one or two wires and they don't see the far end of the basket. And that is the point of uncertainty. You don't know as to how to capture that stone, how to make sure that it is within your field of vision, that the stone is being retracted safely within the confines of the basket. So the design of the basket, which actually keeps the entire wire structure within your view is a very important part of how you choose the basket. And you should have enough radial force to you open the ureter and keep it wide enough so that it also forms a part of your stone extraction dynamics. So the basket should have sufficient radial force to keep the op ureter open. And of course, the prime function of a basket being the ability to capture the stones, to retain the stones and disengage the stone when you feel it is appropriate. Now, these are the parameters I'm sure all of you would agree with me. Now you'd be like, at times you're so frustrated that you are actually trying to hold a stone and you're not able to, you know, that is the capturing capability. And you pick up a stone, but suddenly you see it drops off, you know. 
it might not exactly be something wrong with the basket maybe it is also a wrong choice of basket you have taken i'll tell you why it is important for you to pick a right basket so that the stones don't drop off and it should also be the function should be very smooth so that you should be able to disengage and leave alone the stone wherever you want it it should be of course atraumatic and minimal trauma and the maneuverability should be good so that you should be able to reach any corner of the calyx so these are the properties that you would look for as far as the baskets are concerned and like i described those forces that are important in the guide wire there are some characteristics that you should understand are important in baskets as well that's the perforation force that is what is the force that the basket can go through the pelvic calyx system or a ureter to damage it what is the radial dilatation force that is to say how it, the basket opens expands and keeps the ureter open and how are the open dynamics you know how does the basket actually open does it open like a long nose or does it open like a stout you know these are the two things you should be able to understand when you use a basket there is no point going into the pelvic calyx system or in the ureter and then realize no this basket is not the kind that i would want so always check how the basket opens how wide does the basket open before using it and of course what is the resistance towards deflection that depends on the size of the basket you use the material the basket is made with and, and of course especially in your flexible ureteroscopy so these are the parameters that you should know before you start using it and this is uh, i mean it's a busy table i understand but just look at the number of names that are available for different kinds of baskets there are so you know there's no fancy and majority of us tend to learn with these names uh, for example like a skylight a halo a dakota engage basket you know expand escape uh, so fa fancy names and all of us tend to use these names but before i would request the seniors or the teachers here to not you know push through these names the basket names by the company when you are actually teaching your residents try and keep the description of a basket much more basic is it a tipless is it a zero tip basket is it an etanol made basket is it an open end basket what is the size of the basket these are the terms you would use so that they understand as to what are the characteristics of a basket and then we go to the name but if you start learning the baskets from the name per se then you tend to forget what are the characteristics of this basket no one no one would know if it is a tipless basket or is it a basket with a tip is it an open end basket is it an internal basket is it a 1.9 fringe basket or is it a 2.2 fringe basket so the moment we start describing these things with the characteristics of a basket the better that we know what we are wanting here rather than the names now i've just randomly picked few options here what are the kinds of baskets available in this particular case i have chosen from in one particular company so that you know you would know what are the spectrum of uh, baskets that are available in the market we will try and see a couple of them which are the most commonly used in our day to day practice especially the zero tip nitinol baskets these the most commonly used baskets to pick up your stones which are much more you know flexible and kink resistant and with a very low friction quotient as far as the sheath is concerned so you gently slide through your basket i mean through your endoscopes easily as well as you know when the basket the wires come out and go back in so these two actions should be equally seamless for you to have a good uh, stone retrieval exercise and these are multi layered ones with strength and enhanced uh, flexibility the things the points you would uh, be noting noticing here is that uh, gone of those days where we would use a three fringe basket so i don't think many of us are even bothered to talk about it but 2.4 fringe and 2.2 fringe used to be one of the most commonly used baskets at least in the days when i was training or i mean we would also saw a three fringe basket but then nowadays you know there is a paramount importance on how tiny the 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 basket shaft size can go down to if you can look at this small uh, uh, figural description here when you pass a, a, a 1.9 french basket through a, a 3.6 french working roughly around 3 to 3 3 to 4 uh, french working channel of your ureteroscope or even a flexible ureteroscope it is 41% more irrigation when you compare to a 2.2 1.9 2.2 is like 40% more irrigation you do get but if you have to compare with the 2.4 it's 128% so that's how significant it is to use a smaller basket that will make your life much more easier because the saline flows much more comfortably but there are three parameters you should understand in a basket like i just said if you look at the table the first one says sheath outer diameter that is what 1.9 is all about what is the length of the basket 
there are two options one is a 90 centimeter one the other one is a 120 centimeter one how many of you actually know about this please do introspect there are two different lengths as far as the basket is concerned and the most i would say a tricky one which none more, most of us wouldn't know is the tip opening volume there is always this parameter which demands uh, this defines this how much does the tip of a basket can actually capture now this says 12 millimeters so the maximum stone load that this tip can take is 12, 12 millimeters of the stone not that you'll be able to pull out a 12 millimeter stone but yes you should be aware that also says that how wide a basket can open so a tip opening volume is something which all of you should be aware of when you're using a basket otherwise i'll give you an example where you get stuck you actually take a basket in you feel that you can engage this basket stone better you cap pick it up come back into the ureter or an access sheet and suddenly feel that it's not coming out you know because the engaging capacity of this basket is more but the diameter of the access sheet or a ureter that can accommodate is less for you to primarily counter that it is always ideal for you to pick and choose a basket which can engage the size of the volume of the stone within the uh, safety uh, parameters of whatever the procedure you're doing in. so always be aware of tip opening volume and of course zero tip is much more safer i mean this is a point proven a tip basket versus a tipless basket is very well proven that a zero tip is much more safer the tip tends to you know uh, damage the pelvic system more Coming to the sizes of it, there are much more smaller size of baskets like 1.7s, 1.5s, which I've just marked with a blue uh, underline there. If you can go down a couple of parameters that, look at that, he says expanded diameters of 8 and 11. So this is what I'm trying to impress upon. Do be aware of what is the diameter when the basket is expanded. This is very important for us to know. And this is, do you know that there is a 1.3 French Nettinol basket? Yes, you do have. And look at these volumes that are available options. Like I said, there is a six, there is a seven, there is a nine, and there is 11. So if you look at the picture carefully, when the basket is completely open, look at how narrow the six millimeter is and look how wide 11 millimeter opens. Now, now I am sure that you're able to understand why this parameter is very important for you so that you choose and pick a right basket. And if you have to compare the open-ended baskets, there are two, one of the most popular ones in the market are the Dakota and the Engage, which reach much deeper into the pelvic elicyl system, and they can capture tiny stones very close to the PCS. That's the advantage of having an open-ended basket. And it comes, of course, in uh, 1.9 French, but mind you, there are two volumes or tip opening capacities. One is eight and one is 11 millimeter uh, uh, basket. That is important because that says that how wide the three prongs open. I'll show you a small video if you can appreciate in this if you see my hand wouldn't move much i'm very stable with what i'm doing with the basket there but the ability for the basket to open as wide as it can see or as small as it is very versatile you know i can pick up a very small fragment and in this case now i would pick up a large chunk of stones this is what i'm trying to impress upon uh, open and basket can open as wide as you want in this case 11 millimeters or it can be only eight millimeters so that gives you an idea of how an open-ended basket would help beautifully well especially when you're working in a very close space very close to the pelvic elicyl system if it is a zero tip which opens vertically as the basket goes forward your scope comes backwards so that's where the advantage is to use an open-ended basket so that you stay close to the stone with a very minimal space between the pelvic elicyl wall and the scope get capture the stone that's the advantage in using an open-ended basket and there are papers which have compared these things by and large you know the the durability characteristics are more or less the same however uh, dakota scores over engage in terms of capturing larger stones especially more than seven millimeters another interesting uh, stone retrieval device is escape wherein you actually grip the stone keep it within the basket introduce a 200 uh, micron laser fiber and break the stone as it is sitting within the basket. This is another interesting uh, stone um, retrieval device, which you can do lithotripsy as the stone is intact. In fact, you can use a 1.9 French basket and a 200 micron uh, laser fiber. That would be equivalent to using a 2.4 French uh, basket. Of course, there would be a compromise on renal flow, but it's got its own advantages and disadvantages. And stone cone, I'm sure many of you would have seen this. I'm not sure how many of you are actually using this, but it does help, uh, you know, for the uretric stones not flying away into the 
pelvic glacial system are not landing up doing a flexible ureteroscopy but i guess these days everybody loves to do a ureteroscopy and they don't mind the stone flying into the pcs however this is designed to prevent a stone migration or safe extraction of stones within the ureter and it can be placed by two modalities either under vision through endoscope or by a fluoroscopy and there are various other uh, uh, designs of baskets out there in the market which are with a barbed wire pattern with uh, with you know a innovative rotation wheel so that the basket actually takes a different shape into different corners of the belly glacial system and you pick up those stones in those odd corners uh, one of the companies actually manufactures these kind of baskets as well and before i leave uh, with the baskets uh, topic as well there is one of the new prototypes that have been published where you know uh, once you capture a stone into the basket it actually has a parameter to measure the size of the stone so it's called an automatically fixating stone basket it's got a retinol spring you know, that is for safety and effectiveness of stone retrieval but uh, it also gives you the idea of what is the stone volume with that you know there is a if you can see the arrow mark there it says that what is the volume of the stone that you are extracting so that you are more careful when you the pull the basket out so yes there are newer designs that are coming out with a lot of possibilities out there and uh, if i have to take a guide is one of these stone retrieval guides which uh, boston scientific proposes as to when do you use the zero tip basket you know when you are larger stone larger number of stones especially in kidney and ureter you tend to use a zero tip when do you use uh, you know a dakota basket like i said it is in a tight calyx or in a lower core calyx or in fact in any calyx i would say where you don't have much space to work between the wall and the basket or your scope you can use a, a dakota basket and again like optiflex or escape is to prevent retropulsion like we just discussed and of course stone cone uh, baskets in the ureter where you want to prevent the migration of stones back in La last but not the least i mean you should know about this accessory that there is this backloading biopsy forceps to do your upper urinary tract uh, biopsy of the tumors where we use baskets actually to pull out a sample but we can go one step further to have a, a, a an accessory like this where you can take a biopsy of uh, upper tract tumors rather than using a snare or a, a basket to pull the tumors which is much more traumatic i feel so now it's time for us to decide as to like i said you need to do the strategy and some research before you know as to what is that that you want to ideally pick up so it's now time to, for you to decide as to which is the product and for that you should know enough information about it you should have done some analysis you should know knowledge about the r and d you should have some experience about various products and then i am sure you would be picking up the right guideware or a basket uh, i would say that has been a, a, a talk which is uh, i hope is informative to all of you and i again thank uh, team boston scientific for the opportunity and i hope i have passed on the message to all the uh residents and other my colleagues who are watching this talk thanks and thank you for this opportunity thank you sir uh indeed it was very informative and uh a lucid but at very comprehensive uh talk on wires and baskets uh uh so we have few questions uh and with your permission so we would uh, uh i would like to uh put forward those questions to you yes, uh sir. so uh so one of the question is like uh, how do you uh I mean, in fact, do you use both hydrophilic and hybrid guidewires in your regular practice? If so, uh, what is their role? Uh, yeah, like I mean, uh, both of them obviously do have a, a role in uh, my, my, my practice, and I definitely do use both of them. Hydrophilic guidewires, uh, like our thermo guidewires, are the the most commonly used guidewires. I and mean, however, once you get used to a hybrid guideware which has got the best of the both worlds if 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 you if normally you know a lot of people ask if it was one guideware if you would choose these days you know what would you have it on your operating table that would be a hybrid guideware isn't it so you have a flexible tip and you have a rigid enough shaft so if it's one guideware that you are asking what you want me on the table i would pick a hybrid guideware if it is you know otherwise in a given scenario which is the safest guideware i would have always on my table it would be a hydrophilic you know thermo guideware so so is it safe to say that so you would start with a hybrid guideware and maybe in certain scenarios when you are stuck maybe you would want to uh, shift to a hydrophilic guideware just to get access in case you are not yes yes of course see the uh, like i said if the 15 cm tip in a flexible uh, you know uh, guideways in in a hybrid guideware is not getting you an access the next thing you would want is to put your step one foot back and then look at your you know 
uh, thermo or a hydrophilic guide wires to see if you can safely get them access. Yes. Sure, sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, so one more question is, uh, do you use different guide wires for RIRS and PCNL? And if so, what would be the uh, difference? I mean, how would you choose? Yeah. So again, as far as RIRS is concerned, we are talking about access to the upper tract as far as uh, putting your access sheet is concerned. Again, so that one guide wire which I would always use in RIRS would be a hybrid guide wire. Or even otherwise, I would use a simple hydrophilic guide wire, which is minimally traumatic. And I'm more than happy to use a hydrophilic guide wire to even put across an access sheet. So mind you that you don't need much of resistance to put your access sheet into the uh, upper tract. The fact that you're actually pushing it through means that you are not supposed to put the access sheet. So if your access sheet is gliding in very smoothly with a simple hydrophilic guide wire, that is more than enough. However, for PCNL again, to get your initial access across the track, you know, you have, you use much more, you know, uh, thicker guide wires, say 0.35 or 0.08. And that is where you would use much stiffer guide wires when you compare to a uh, RIRS access. Yeah. Sure, sir. Thank you. And uh, so one more uh, question we have is, uh, are there any specific basket you would use in the case of PCNL? So yeah, again, uh, see, I mean, off late, see, uh, as far as uh, PCNL is concerned, if you're tending to use a flexible nephroscope to retrieve, you know, a flexible nephroscope to retrieve stones through a percutaneous tract, obviously you would be using uh, a basket, uh, especially because you wouldn't use a rigid instrument through a flexible scope to pull out. Uh, that is where your you know, open-ended baskets come into picture. Uh, are a large volume zero tip baskets. These are the two uh, favorable choices. And yes, especially in a tricky PCNL where you are going through an inaccessible calyx with your flexible nephroscope, uh, open and uh, basket is a perfect choice. Great, sir. Uh, thanks for that, sir. And uh, so one more question we have uh, is like, when you use, when do you use JTIP guide wire? And uh, is there any particular scenario in RIRS and PCNL? Yeah, JTIP guide wires, especially, you know, the, are the ones where you would want to tackle these kinks in the upper ureter, especially near the pelvic ureteric junction. And uh, also, uh, you the idea there is to use a PTFE guide wire, which is much more uh, stronger on the shaft, as well as a tip of the, uh, of the guide wire with a J, so that you safely enter into the pelvic system without any trauma. That is one particular scenario where the upper end of the ureter, you want to straighten it, use a, a JTIP guide wire where you, you safely go across it and then again retract back so that the, the ureter becomes straighter. To be uh, frank, I mean, I don't use uh, JTIP much often. Majority of the times my hydrophilic or a hybrid does the job for me. Yeah. Sure, sir. Um, thanks, sir. And uh, so coming back to one of the questions on baskets. So uh, how important it is for a basket to be able to release uh, the stone at will, at your will? Very important, isn't it? Very important. At times you realize, like I said, there are two scenarios where you know, you would land up with this particular situation. The fact that you have grasped a stone and then realized that you are supposed to let go the stone for whatever the reason, maybe you have grabbed a stone, which is larger than the size, larger than uh, whatever the volume of access sheet or the uretic volume is. So you have realized that after you have actually captured the stone or you're already retracting, you've come to a point where you would want the stone to let go. That is when the, the disengaging capacity of the basket becomes very, very important. If it means that you have to test it while you pick up the stone and dropping it, do it in the pelvic calyx system itself so that you're not in soup once you get into the ureter. So for that reason, I was stressing so much about the tip volume of a basket. So you shouldn't have a big basket and to get, get too excited that I can grab the entire volume. There is no fun in grabbing the entire volume when you don't have an access to come out. So be careful when you pick up the volume of a stone and also doubly make sure that the disengaging capacity of the basket is good, especially for us. Unfortunate to say that we all do use, reuse our so-called single use accessories here, and they do not retain the same quality after you use them a couple of times. So better be very careful and check with them before you use them again. Sure, sir. Uh, so uh, I just, uh, I think one of the uh, attendees wanted to just confirm that uh, what you said, like are open-ended baskets safer in terms of disengaging in RIRS? So he, they just, I, I think they're just looking for a confirmation. That yes, they are. Yes, they are. They, are. they definitely are much more safer. In fact, even when you have a zero-tip baskets where all the four wires meet at a common point at the far end, 
you still have a chance that the stone is dangling at that which is like a tub at the end the open end basket is so beautifully designed with even minimal engagement it opens in all three corners and the stone drops in no time so as much as it is good to grab a stone it's a close quarters it is also equally comfortable for you to let go the stone yes it is sure sir uh, so one more question we have a zero tip basket 1.9 french uh, with 120 cm catheter length can it be used for lower pole calyx stones yes of course of course we can use there is no i mean i don't see any reason why particularly this size and length of the basket is mentioned here we can use the length of uh, the basket primarily comes into role because it it comes in when you using a flexible ureteroscope because the shaft length is quite long when it compared to your semi rigid short 8 french ureteroscopes you need a much longer length of the basket when you use in flexible ureteroscopy or in the longer 45 cm semi rigid ureteroscopes it is primarily of what is the uh, size of the length of the uh, endoscope that you are using versus the length of the basket but otherwise the engaging capacity is more or less the same yes you can use sure sir uh, so just taking a liberty from uh, taking forward that question and uh, like suppose if it if you have to consider between zero tip basket and an open uh, ended basket i mean uh, opening uh, basket so which one would you choose in the case of a lower pole uh, stone in a particular scenario or otherwise a lower pole stones especially in lower, lower pole stones. stones yes again in lower pole stones see there are a couple of things as far as uh, the tricks in actually engaging the stone into your basket okay as far as a zero tip basket is concerned in a lower pole especially you would be opening the basket and you would be struggling to actually engage the stone into the basket in a lower pole because a subsequent movement or 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 your hand movements of capturing a stone in the lower pole with a zero tip basket needs a, a bit more refined movements because you would want the basket to engage the stone either going under the stone or going above the stone or coming medially or laterally which all should happen in your hand if that is getting challenging a relatively simple straight forward way of capturing stones in lower pole calyx would be definitely an open ended basket much more relatively so you look at the stone open and capture that is as simple as that but a zero tip basket would require a bit more refined movements for you to capture a stone yes maybe i would i would mean i feel that it might be a relatively easier job to hold a stone with an open end basket in lower pole sure um so uh, so there's another uh, follow up question is so can open ended basket be considered as one universal basket in any situation or is there any specific indication for a zero tip uh yes you can i mean i would say that predominantly when you're using a basket where you would be retracting the stones through the ureter without an access sheet a open ended basket might get tricky because the funnel or the tip of the basket stays a bit open like a tri prong you know a zero tip basket would be much more smoother like a cone which would come out through the ureter much safely maybe that is the only reason why otherwise as far as getting hold of the stones we can use open end anywhere we want sure sir um so one more question is uh, uh the what is uh, any specific application of stainless steel guide wires in your practice um uh, and at least stainless steel guide wires have been very i mean i mean i don't use uh, stainless steel guide wires at least in these days but uh, um, i guess in uh, in situations where the ureteric obstructions are very dense you know densely fibrous uh, situations where the ureter is badly uh, damaged where you're not able to get through these but you know as much as i say these these stainless steel guide wires can equally be traumatic so it's tricky to say that they can hold on the shaft and the uh, the caliber of the ureter and go through an obstruction better it can also be traumatic to be frank i mean i don't use stainless steel guide wires so sure, sir uh, so one last question as we are hitting the last minute of the hour uh, so uh, which is the most common diameter of the guide wire you use or, and are there any specific scenarios where you deviate from that if i have to be one guide wire as far as the size is concerned 1.9 french guide wire is the most commonly used we are slowly trying to get down to 1.7s now again the the smaller the caliber of the guide wire the tip opening volume also goes down a bit but yes uh, these are the days where you are not holding up larger volume stones to pull out so 1.9 would be the best choice and 1.7 would be even better if if you get a hand on it yeah sure sir uh so uh thanks a lot sir and uh, i think uh, it's been uh, a great session and uh, we had lot of uh, learnings and i'm sure 
uh, the attendees are taking forward a lot of learnings and uh, i'm sure this will also help their help them in their practice as well Thank and uh, thanks a lot for uh, your patience uh, answering patients in terms of answering all the questions as well and looking forward for many more sessions with you sir and uh, i would like to thank you for uh, specifically talking on the subject and uh, thanks to all the attendees uh, who have encouraged us by joining in uh, in huge numbers on this webinar and uh, looking forward for many more such webinars and thank you sir thank thanks you so thanks the entire team of boston scientific for the opportunity thank you. thank thanks you, uh, all the attendees to, for being here for the patient listening thank you thank you thank you sir thanks for you